Praise the Lord. Well, close our eyes. Just keep it sitting down, but close your eyes and bow your head. And commit yourself to the Lord for the Bible study today. That the Lord himself will help you to understand, to apply the word to your life. To help you see the application of the word to your life. That as you come and study day after day and week after week, that the impact of the word in your heart, your life, your behavior, in your commitment, consecration to the Lord will be visible for all the people to see. And that you yourself will have the witness of the Spirit. That this word of God you are studying is making an impact in your life. That this same life that Daniel lived, the Lord by his grace and his strength and his power will reproduce it in your life. In Jesus' name we pray. Heavenly Father, we bless your name for our Bible study tonight once again. Thank you for our brothers and sisters, our children, boys and girls, youths, who are here also to study with us. Thank you, Lord, for all the locations where we're gathered together, all over this country and beyond this country, in the whole of Africa and beyond. Lord, we pray that your word will have an inroad into every life and every heart, even tonight in Jesus' name. We pray that the grace that comes with studying the word, the power that comes with the study of the word, the anointing, the unction that comes with the understanding of the word, will come to every one of us tonight in Jesus' name. Change us and turn us around. Touch our minds, our hearts, our spirit, our soul, every part of us, so that, Lord, this stable, righteous principle that you established in Daniel, you established in every one of us in Jesus' name, be exalted, honored, and glorified in our lives. Thank you, Lord. We pray that our neighbors will see the effect and the impact, the result of the study of the word in our hearts and our lives. We bless your name because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. We're looking at Daniel today. We've been studying Daniel now for the past three weeks. Now we're in study four of Daniel. And we're looking at Daniel chapter one, reading from verse eight. Daniel chapter one, open your Bible with me, verse eight. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself or the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Verse 9. Now God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. And the prince of the eunuchs said unto Daniel, I fear my lord the king, who has appointed your meat and your drink. For why should he see your faces worse like him than the children which of your sword? Then shall ye make me endanger my head to the king. Verse 11. Then said Daniel to Melzer, whom the prince of the eunuchs I said to over Daniel, Ananiah, I said over Daniel, Ananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, prove thy servants, I beseech thee ten days, and let them give us pulse to eat and water to drink. Then let our countenance be looked upon before thee, and the countenance of the children that eat of the portion of the king's meat. And as thou seest, deal with thy servants. So he consented to them in this matter, and proved them ten days. And at the end of the ten days, their countenances appeared fairer and fatter in flesh 
than all the children which did eat the portion of the king's meat. Thus Melza took away the portion of their meat and the wine that they should drink and give them pause. That's what we're looking at today and you'll find in verse 8, the opening verse of her passage, giving us the pattern, the portrait, the picture, the practice of an uncompromising life. That word, uncompromising, have you ever thought about it? Because that is the very essence of this whole chapter. That is the very essence of the life that Daniel lived. That's the very essence of the power, the anointing, the unction, the authority, the dominion that came upon the life of Daniel. That's the very essence of the usefulness and the worthiness of Daniel when he was in Babylon. That's the very essence of God picking up this man, Daniel, and making him a worthy, useful effective and competent instrument and tool in his son. Look at that again. Daniel chapter 1 verse 8. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not. Those two words, would not. You see, there are people that do not know how to say no. They do not know how to refuse. They do not know how to reject. They do not know how to be firm. They do not know how to be steadfast. And you know when in the primary school, they taught us. And those uh, primary school teachers were trying to prepare us for the life ahead. To live a stable life, a steadfast life, an uncompromising life, a principled life. What did they teach us? They taught us in singing. Wherever you go, and whatever you do, and wherever you be, do not say yes when you ought to say no. The ability to say no to the flesh, the ability to say no to the king of Babylon, the ability to say no to the prince of the eunuchs, the ability to say no to temptation, and there you say, I would not. That's the essence of the uncompromising life. Let me show you. Look at that Daniel once again. Daniel chapter 1 verse 8. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not. And you need to get that basic principle in your heart. I would not. I will not. I cannot. I must not do that. I'm looking at 1 Kings chapter 13. In 1 Kings chapter 13, I'm reading from verse 7. 1 Kings 13 verse 7. And the king said unto the man of God, Come home with me and refresh thyself, and I will give thee a reward. And the man of God said unto the king, If thou wilt give me half thine house, I will not, those words, the very essence of a principled life, of an uncompromising life, of a steadfast life, of a righteous, holy, sanctified, saintly life. I will not go in with thee, neither will I eat bread nor drink water in this place, for so it was charged me by the word of the Lord. That's it. Knowing the word of the Lord, standing on the word of the Lord, believing the word of the Lord, wanting to live by the word of the Lord. And whatever contradicts that word, coming from a king, coming from a prince, coming from a neighbor, you say, I will not. That's the essence of an uncompromising life. Nehemiah, I'm looking at chapter 6. Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 3. And I sent messengers unto them, saying, I am doing a great work so that I cannot calm down. Those words, I cannot. I will not. I cannot. I would not. I must not. I'm committed to something. I've given my heart, my life, my will to something. And because of that, anything 
different, anything contrary, I will not. That is the essence of an uncompromising life. Verse 11, and I said, Shall such a man as I flee? And who is there that being as I am would go in into the temple to save his life? I will not go in. That's Nehemiah. He said in verse 11, I cannot. He said in verse 11, I will not. If you are going to live an uncompromising life, those two words will not. Those two words would not. That important symbolic word cannot, must not leave your mouth. You must be able to know when to say no. No matter the height, no matter the strength, no matter the power of the person that is asking you to do something contrary to the will of God, you must know when to say, I will not. Nehemiah chapter 10. Nehemiah chapter 10. I'm reading from verse 29. They claim to their brethren, their nobles, their nobles, and entered into a curse, actually into a covenant. And it went oath to walk in, the, in God's law, which was given by Moses, the servant of God. And to observe and to do all the commandments of the Lord our God and his judgments and his statutes. And that we would not, that's the word, that's the word. If you're going to live a steady life. A life that is not falling and rising. A life that is committed to the Lord and committed to the word of the Lord. You must be able to know at what point you're going to just be following people. There must come a time in your life if you're a man of principle. A man that has salvation. A mission unto the people of the land. And take not take their daughters for our sons. Verse 31. And if the people of the land bring where or any victuals on the Sabbath day to sell, that we would not buy each of them on the Sabbath day. And that those are the words thinking, we would not, we would not. And when you think of people like Joseph, that's okay then, we will not. You think of people like that said, Daniel, we would not. That's what made him an uncompromising prophet. To think of Nehemiah, that's what kept him. We would not. I'm looking at Job chapter 27. Job chapter 27. And I'm reading from verse 5. God forbid that I should justify you till I die. I will not. I'm telling you. Those words, I will not. If you have not come to the position, to the place where you say, This I will not do. The mountains may move, the seas may roar, and darkness may cover the land during the day. But this I will not do. They may take their job, they may take their money, but this I will not do. A temptation may be there, a trial may be there. This I will not do. It is that that makes you to live an uncompromising life. You are a believer, and your husband is not a believer. You must come to the point where you know this is the word of God. And what the husband is demanding, if it is contrary to the word of God, you come to the point to say, I will not. Your wife is not a believer, you the husband, you are a believer. And the wife is demanding something. That is contrary to the word of God. You come to the point where you say, This I will not do. That is what makes an uncompromising Christian life. Look at verse 5 again. Don't forbid that I should justify you till I die. I will not remove my integrity from me, but six, my righteousness, I hold fast. I will not, you see this was, I will not let it go. My heart shall not reproach me so long as I leave. Daniel chapter 3. Daniel chapter 3. Hey, this is what makes up the uncompromising lie. For you to know when you to say no. 
and to say that no in an irreversible way, that you say no and you don't change your mind. You already have studied the situation. You have looked at the word of God. You have looked at the commandments of God. And you have looked at the commandments of men. And you see that the men are telling you to dishonor God, disregard God, disobey God. And then when you have summed up everything, say, I will not. Irreversible. Unchanging. You are steadfast. And you stand where you stand. That's what we call the uncompromising life. Daniel chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 17. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the bony fairy points, and he will deliver us out of the hand of him. But if not, but if not, we believe in miracles, but if not, if it doesn't happen, we believe God can see us through that trial. We believe God can tone down that heat. We believe God can preserve our lives in the midst of that very voice. We believe He's able to protect us. We will not burn. But if not, even if we burn, but if we suffer, the Padmesa, be it known unto you, okay, that we will not. This was. We will not. That's the essence of the life of the Christian. As you are passing through this world, and you are living the life that will bring glory and honor to the Lord. For you to be able to say, I would not, I will not, I must not, I cannot. I've reached that position, I'm taking a decision, I'm going to live for the Lord. Verse 18, we will not serve thy God. No worship the golden image which thou hast set up. We're looking at Acts of the Apostles, chapter 4. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 4. In Acts of the Apostles, chapter 4, here is what we learn again. Those two words will not, must not, cannot, would not. Acts chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 18. And he called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. Well, the Lord had told them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. But now these people invited them and said, now, we know you are following Jesus. I've decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. They said, don't carry that one here. If you carry that one here, that Jesus is not physically here, we'll deal with you. So, they commanded them, do not preach, do not teach in this name. Look at verse 19. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judging what we can not you see that you see that except those words come into your life except those words become very steady and rooted in your Christian experience you know, just be wishy washy Christian you'll be falling under every pressure yielding to every temptation you'll not be able to stand but he said but we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard Acts chapter 21. In Acts chapter 21, I'm reading from verse 10. Acts chapter 21. Reading from verse 10. And as we tarried there many days, there came down from Judea a certain prophet named Agabus. And when he was come unto us, he took Paul's cattle and bound his own hands and feet. And said, Thus says the Holy Ghost, So shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man that owneth this ghetto, and shall deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. And when we had these things, both we, the companions and the friends, and the co travelers were called the apostle, we, and they of that place besought him not to go up to Jerusalem. They don't want him to preach. But then the prophecy came. The revelation came. As you go to do that preaching, there will be suffering. 
every persecution, every pain. The people of the Jews are going to wield all their evil power to oppose you, to oppress you, to punish you for the preaching. When well, we had that, we loved Paul so much, we just wanted him to suffer. And we said, please, Paul, don't go. Look at verse 13. Then, on and search, for me ye to weep and to break mine heart. I am ready not to be bound only, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. Listen to this. And when he would not, those words, when he would not, those are the essential words, important words, those are the words that make an uncompromising life. And when he would not be persuaded, we see saying, the will of the Lord be done. May the will of the Lord be done in your life. When you make up your mind, you say, I'm saved. Have Jesus living inside me. Have my Bible in my hands. I have the charge. And the principle of living, the Lord has reached that, registered that in my heart. And this I'm going to follow to the end of my life. And challenges come, persecutions come, trials come, temptations come, oppositions come. And you still say, I would not change or alter what I said I will do, that I will do. That is the rapturable, righteous, rewardable life. I pray God will help every one of us. That would be verse in Daniel chapter 1, verse 8. Tells us the patch and the portrait, the picture, the practice of an uncompromising life. The world has entered into an era of compromise. And it is being plunged into great decline, great decay and moral destitution. From early childhood to late adulthood. Our society compels its people to learn the art and the way of compromise. Most lives follow a path of least resistance. Moral standards and righteous principles are sacrificed in pursuit of worldly goals. The people who are Christians before, and they began to have some goals, some desires. They want to achieve this and accomplish this. And because their mind is on achieving material things, they will be making money. Be successful. Get into that place. Having a position. Because of that, they compromise, they sacrifice the decision, the consecration, the education they made before. Such a self centered perspective is so prevalent in the world today. It's a world of compromise. Even many so called Christians worship the God of experience and pragmatism. What does that mean? Their motto is if it will bring material gain, if it will make you happy, do it. There are many things that make people happy, but do not make them holy. To be holy is higher and greater than being happy. You can be holy and sad. And Joseph. Holy, or thrown into the prison, holy and sad. Like Samuel, holy and sad, both grieved in his heart. Because the people of Israel determined this is what he will do. And this Samuel fell on his face before the Lord. And God said, I know you are grieved, they want a king, they have rejected you, they have rejected me. They can be holy and sad. The apostles, they were holy, sanctified. They were thrown into jail. They were sad. Holy and sad. Happiness is not always possible. And whenever you have a choice whether to be holy or to be happy, you choose to be holy. Even if they bring unhappiness, 
Vaš is the life that will make heaven eventually. But you know the people of the world are people who are not barely understanding in their Christian life. They say, you know, it will not make me happy. The people will put pressure on me. The people will persecute me. The people will do this or that. And if it doesn't give me happiness, I cannot do it. You'll not always be happy, but you can be holy. And I pray God will preserve you in that holiness in Jesus' name. In a good amen. These people we're talking about, they're no longer concerned for any moral standard, for any biblical principle. People easily give up their convictions or consciences to gain some practical edge. It has the whole works of life, corporate executives, sales people, individuals in all areas of human endeavor are given to compromise. It's like they want to bend the rules so they can achieve what they want to achieve. They want to shade and color the truth, modify the truth, mutilate the truth. They want to do whatever is dictated and required by the situation in order to get what they want. In this perilous base, compromise has become a way of life. This is the great challenge that we face. We need a Daniel in every family. I pray you need that Daniel. We need a Daniel in every office. When those of these people say, this is what we are going to do, and you know, contradict the word of God, even if you are the only one able to say no, that's what it means to be a Daniel in that office. A Daniel in every school. A teacher. See all the other teachers going this direction. And you be able to have the boldness and the courage and the conviction, the consecration to say no. Even if you are the only Daniel of a teacher in that school. It's too late to be able to say no. Even if you are the only student in that class, in that school, in that college, in that university, that will say no. We need a Daniel in every school, a Daniel in every community. We need Daniel, people, Daniels everywhere, who will stand for the right, not minding the cost. The cost is there, the price to pay, that's there. It will not always be convenient, but it will get you ready for heaven. Through divine grace, each of us, like Daniel, can live a consistent uncompromising life. We will in Jesus' name. We're dividing the story tonight to three parts. Number one, the purposeful heart of an uncompromising life. Number two, the persevering habit of an uncompromising life. Number three, the promised heritage of an uncompromising life. Let's come to number one, a purposeful heart of an uncompromising life. If you're going to live an uncompromising life, you must have a purposeful heart. A heart full of purpose. And not essentials are cleared from the heart because the heart is full already. And this purpose of yours has filled your heart. Are you going to listen to any other voice? You're not going to think of any other thing. The purpose you have of following the Lord, rain or sunshine. The purpose you have in following righteous principles, whether you are appreciated or you are not appreciated. The purpose in your heart that you are following after the Lord and wherever it leads you, that's where you are getting to when your heart is full of that purpose. You will live an uncompromising life. By now we should know Daniel chapter 1 verse 8 in memory. Let us look at it now. Chapter 1 verse 8 of Daniel. But Daniel purposed in his heart. You will have a purpose of heart. I say you have a purpose of heart. And you know, if you are coming to the study and just enjoy the study, but you don't take a decision and say, that situation in my family, I know it's calling me to compromise. And tonight, I make up my mind, this is my purpose. If you don't do that, the study will mean nothing. I know that situation in my school where I'm teaching, where I'm learning, where I'm schooling. I know this is what you require. And now I see very clearly. And I can differentiate between right and wrong. 
Now, tonight, I have a purpose of that. This is my purpose. If you don't do that, not much will be done. Between you and your children, you've been arguing about a particular point, and children are threatening you. I say, Daddy, if you don't yield on this, and say, Bible, 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 rather than to continue living in this house, and you make up your mind tonight. You see, it's the church that will control your Christian life. Or Christ will control your Christian life if you don't have a purpose, a set mind, and to say, This is the purpose of my heart. You will not be able to live the Christian life. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not define himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the priests of the eunuchs that she might not defile himself. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 11. Acts 11, verse 23. In Acts 11, verse 23, when he came and had seen the grace of God, when he came and had seen the grace of God. Brothers and sisters, look up here. Do you see grace? I thought grace is invisible. Can I see the air? There is air in all these walls. I cannot see the air. Air is invisible. Can I see love? It has a spiritual quality. I cannot see it. How do you see grace? How do you see love? How do you see faith? How do you see the air? By the action of the air. When the breeze is blowing, I can feel it in my body. I can see it as it affects the trees. And they are moving here and here. I see the air is there. I see faith by the action of the faith. I see the grace in you. If you are born again, by grace are you saved. How do I see that grace? By the action, by the behavior, by the new life, by the purpose you are taking. By saying no to what you say no to. By saying yes to what you ought to say yes to. It is that action. It is that behavior. It is that righteous and that lived out in a practical way. That's what makes us to see the grace in you. And look at it again, verse 23, when he came, when he had seen the grace of God, he was glad and exhorted them all that with purpose of heart, that with purpose of heart, that with purpose of heart. If you are standing, and you don't have a purpose of how to stand. There's a devil that wants to push you down. There are tempters that want to push you down. There are people that want to derail you, get you out of the rail. There are people that want to confuse you. It, it is that purpose of heart. And you say, I know there's a devil there. I know that the temptations are there. I know the challenges are there. I know the opposers are there. I know the people that do not want me to be fully committed to Christ. I know they are there. But to stand with your two feet firmly, it is that purpose that makes you to stand. And then the devil will not be able to push you down. I said the devil will not be able to push you down. That with purpose of heart, he will cleave unto the Lord. We're looking at Psalm 119. Psalm 119. I'm reading from the scripture 1. The proud have had me greatly in derision, yet I have not declined for thy law. They have had me, they, they make fun, they abuse, they source, they jest, they joke. And they almost blaspheme. But is the purpose of heart. In the midst of that blasphemy, that insult, that will make you to still keep to watch the standing of yet, have I not declined from thy love? Verse 69. A proud have forged a lie against me. 
You don't want you to get into defending yourself with argument. You don't want you to waste your time. Take your time away from concentrating upon the Lord and praying unto the Lord and be, you know, again about I did, I did not, and this and that. That's what you want to do. You want to distract your attention. But it says, but I will keep that princess with my whole heart. Verse 157. In verse 157, it says, Many are my persecutors and mine enemies, yet do I not decline from thy testimonies. Verse 161. It says, Princes have persecuted me without a cause. I look at my life, uh, you know, care to the word of God. And I love God and love the people, but all the same, without any reason, that demands persecution. The princes, they persecuted me without a cause. But my heart standeth in awe of thy word. Verse 1, verse 6. Verse 1, verse 6. I have sworn, I will perform it, that I will keep thy righteous judgment. And that's what the Lord is expecting that each of us will do. That you'll take your stand and you'll say, here is where I stand. I will not move from my steadfastness in following after the Lord. You will see the heart of the matter is the matter of the heart. That is the heart of this matter of uncompressing life we're talking about. is the matter of the heart. A weak heart will compromise. And a stable heart will compromise. A fearful, timid heart will compromise. A double heart, an uncircumcised heart, a covetous heart will compromise. The key to an uncompromising life is an established heart that is feast on God's glory and on scriptural standard. All real commitment of lasting value has its beginning in the heart. With righteous, a righteous purpose. The heart is a seed plot of all noble deeds. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for to be the issues of life. A cleansed heart, cleaving to the Lord, established by grace, will always lead to a purposeful, principled life. With purpose of heart, such a believer makes pleasing God his chief aim is number one priority in life. He will readily deny himself so he can keep to his purpose. Not only that, he will displease the world. Displease the world. That's something you need to go on your knees and learn. If you're a yes man, a yes woman, it will be hard to be a Christian. If everybody that ever says anything without you considering whether it's right or yes, madam, yes, sir. If you're a yes man, a yes woman, yes, yes, yes to everything in life, yes, yes, yes to everything that everybody says, you cannot be a Christian. And when people see that that is how you are, if they frown at you, if they bully on you, if they stretch in you, and if they wield a strong hand, and then they want you to pass life. Since you're a yes man, a yes woman, you just crumble. And then you'll be conquered. You'll not be able to stand. But it is when you say, Lord, I need strength in my spirit. Strength of character in my soul. I don't want to hurt anybody, but I want to get to heaven. And because I want to get to heaven, and it's going to take righteousness to get to heaven. And the devil is not going to make it easy for me to get to heaven, for you to get to heaven. And if he sees any crack in your wall of consecration, if he sees any loophole in your life, if he sees that you're a cringy man, a cowardly woman, a timid man, a fearful woman, if he sees that, he's going to come through that avenue and put some real terrible pressure and heat upon your life. And since you're a yes man, you'll not be able to stand. That's the way he wants to use to hinder you from getting to heaven. You will not succeed. That heaven, you will get there. But if you're going to get to heaven, you will learn to say no. Satan, I'm sorry, no. 
devil, no, that cannot be. I've chosen the way of truth. I've chosen the way of righteousness and holiness. But you will suffer. Yes, Jesus told me that already. But except I deny myself and carry my cross, that I'll not be able to follow it. There's a cross to carry, a cross to bear, and we need to bear that. And if you're not willing to bear the cross and stand for what you believe, are you going to live an uncompromising life? It is that steadiness, steadfastness, that you'll bear the cross, you'll deny yourself, and you will endure the suffering if it has to come. That's what takes us to heaven. That's why it's saying a has to be place and we cling to the Lord, established by grace. And that will lead to a purposeful principle line, and then we dispute the world and we patiently endure the reaction of men while our hearts are fixed on doing the will of God. Your mind is resolute against the temptation to compromise because, like your Creator and Father, is of one mind, and he performs any sin that is appointed. Like the Lord Jesus Christ, your meat is to do the will of him that sent you. And also, looking unto Jesus, who endured the cross, despising the shame. You see what came to Daniel here was temptation. A temptation to forget what he learned when he was back at home in Jerusalem in Judea. It was the first temptation that came upon him. You know what? The devil is watching. Where is your weak point? And the strength of any chain, if you look at a chain, it has a ring coupled with another ring, coupled with another ring, coupled with another ring. That chain, the strength of that chain is at the weakest point. Because they are all linked together. And the devil is watching with this forced temptation. If you overcome, it will give you strength and courage. And assurance in your heart, hey, praise the Lord, I overcame that false temptation. You'll be able to overcome other temptations. If you fail, Daniel, in this forced temptation, the devil knows the method he's going to use every time to catch you. It was a great temptation to become fearful. It was a great temptation to become isolated or insulated, to be afraid of the Babylonians. This is what they want. I'm coming from Jerusalem. I don't fit in. And then to be looking down and not to be bold and courageous for what you believe. It was a great temptation. A great temptation of inferiority. To feel inferior. To feel that almost you are nobody. And to feel that everybody else is superior to you. And your life must be lived under their control. A great temptation. It was a great temptation to have self-interest. Self-interest. Always consider yourself. Now I may suffer. Something may happen to me. I, 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 every time. But as you overcome that, you'll be able to overcome every other temptation in Jesus' name. And so you'll find that Daniel said, I'm not going to be afraid of the frowns of men, or whatever it is they want to do, I will stand. He stood, and you will stand. I said, you will stand. And as the apostles, chapter 5, Acts chapter 5. I mean, in verse 27, Acts chapter 5, verse 27. And when they had brought them, they searched them before the council, and the high priest asked them, saying, Did we not strictly charge you, command you, that you should not teach in this name? And behold, ye have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine, and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Apostles have their peculiar temptations. Teachers of the Bible have their peculiar temptations. Preachers and pastors have their peculiar temptations. And that's what you find sometimes. A person might say, God has given me a call, a commission. I don't want to be the Panay Bible Church and you must see the kingdom of God. I'm still a preacher. I'm still a pastor. I don't want to be in the Panay anymore. Doesn't matter. The kind of a word. 
and then they go out and establish a new ministry, a new church, a new fellowship. And the first day, the condition they had all these years with all their strength, they want to lay a strong foundation in this new ministry. And they preach with all their efforts. Salvation by grace. Sanctification is the second work of grace. Holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. And then those people that, you know, follow them to start that new ministry, they come and they say, ah. So they say the same thing, what are they going to do here? Please, if you do this one here, we will not stay. That's why they don't stand, those people that leave the church. It's not even a council now telling them, don't teach this. It's not San Pedro telling them, it's their own members telling them, you cannot teach this one here in this new ministry. And they just crumble, they're crushed. There's no courage in them to stand on the word of God, wherever you are. Whoever will stay, whoever will not stay, whether you are deep in life as a pastor, as a close speak the children which are of the sort, they shall he make the word of kindness that you find with Daniel. He didn't want to give the knowledge of the scriptures that's available and in the wisdom promised by the Lord that's available to you. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom which all your adversaries shall not be able to gain, say, or resist. Now we come back to Daniel. In this Daniel chapter 1, we're looking at the persevering habit. The habit of not compromising. It was not just one issue. It was not just only one day. He will not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat. He will not defile himself with the wine which he drank. One day, one week, one month, one year, three years, and then for the rest of his life. It was already a habit. As you look at Genesis chapter 39, you are consistent in that life of righteousness. Consistent in that life of saintlyhood. Consistent in that life of holiness. Day after day, week after week. That they know that man, that's an uncompromising man. That woman, that lady, that's an uncompromising woman. A Christian sister. Genesis chapter 39 verse 7. And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph. And she said, lie with me. But he refused. But he refused. That's the life of an uncompromising man. And said unto his master's wife, Behold, my master knoweth not what is not what is with me in the house. And he has committed all that he has to my hand. He said, I'm going to be appreciative. I'm just a slave over here in Egypt. I was sold here. And now the man has committed everything he has into my hand. I have to show gratitude for that. And if I do anything secret, anything sinful, anything immoral, anything defiling with you, his wife, will that be shown appreciation to my master who has given me all these privileges? Who do I know here? And what do I have here? For me to show appreciation, that's what we're talking about. The uncompromising life is not just a dry life an unreasonable life, an unrealistic life. It's a life that is considerate, a life that has love in it, a life that is saying, look at what my master has given to me. Look at the privilege. Because of what I enjoy from my master, I cannot touch you. I cannot do anything with you. There is none greater in verse 9 in this house than I. Neither has he kept back any sin from me but thee, because thou art his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? We're learning something from Joseph. That woman wanted to be unfaithful to her husband. That another person wants to be unfaithful does not mean that I must copy her and be unfaithful. That man is a husband to you. That man is a master to me. You decide you are not going to be faithful to your husband. That is not going to affect me. I'm taking my decision. And the negative action of others and the negative behavior of another person is not going to push me into being negative. You are unfaithful, I'll be faithful. Look at verse 10. And it came to pass as she spake to Joseph how? 
How often? Day by day. Day by the habit of saying no. On Monday, Joseph said no. On Tuesday, the lady came again. Joseph said no. On Wednesday, she came again. Joseph said no. On Thursday, she came. Joseph said no. They are going to test you. They are going to test you. Maybe yesterday, you are not really serious. When you said no, they will come again and come again and come again. It is the habit of maintaining that no that makes you to live an uncompromising life. And then we're told in verse 10, and it came to pass, as she spake to Joseph day by day, that he acted not unto her to lie by her or to be with her. And it came to pass about this time that Joseph went into the house to do his business. And there was none of the men of the house there within. And she caught him by the garment and said, lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled and got him out. This Joseph was serious about his holiness. If you are not serious about your holiness, you say, well, I've resisted enough. Whatever happens now, that's not my fault. Uh, then it means that there's a point in your life that you cannot stand. You will stand. I said you will stand. Job chapter 2. In Job chapter 2, we're looking at verses 9 and 10. Job chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. Then said his wife unto him, Dost thou still retain thine integrity? Cause God and die. But she said unto her, Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What? Shall we receive good at the hand of God? And shall we not receive evil in all this? Did not Job sin with his lips? He made up his mind. Whatever happens, I'm not going to allow anything to take this righteousness, integrity away from me. People will change, but you will not change. Things around you may begin to have another color, another approach. But you will say, since I believe now the Lord Jesus Christ, this is the commitment I give to the Lord. This is my consecration unto the Lord. Like I said to the Lord, I've opened my mouth to the Lord. I will not change. I will not reverse. I will not turn back. We're looking at Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. We're reading from verse 11. And many false prophets shall arise, shall rise and deceive many. I pray you will not be deceived. And because iniquity shall abound. And because iniquity shall abound. Maybe you don't understand. Would you look up for a moment? Anywhere you work, iniquity is abounding. There are things that workers will not do before that now. They have done it and done it and done it. And you know what they say. If you are going to live straight and you are not steal money and change receipts and change things. If you are going to be faithful, go out and buy kerosene, petrol, whatever. And then you come back and report. You don't make any gain. This little salary will not carry anybody. And therefore everything has changed. And the students are going to take exam. Uh, if we don't see this and see that before the exam, you know, nowadays, everybody, they will dictate it to them. If we say we're going to remain righteous, I'm going to have certificate. The iniquities are bounding everywhere. In the home, in the community, in the market, in the school, everywhere you go. Because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. The people just join them. They come to church, but they say church is church. Bible study is Bible study. But in the place of work, if you don't play the same game, and if you don't go through the same gambling, and if you don't write the same thing, if you don't sign what everybody is signing, they leave you behind and you will never be able to make it. That's why people are compromising. But it's the people that will take their stand, and you are one of those people. In verse 13, but he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. You will stand to the end. You will endure to the end. Second Timothy chapter 3. In Second Timothy chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 12. Yea, 
And all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. There will be a little persecution. What are we talking about in the early church? The stone stealing him. And he died. They killed him. But he took a stand. In the early church, a history tells us that they crucified Peter, Simon Peter, upside down. All the same, he took his stand. Church history tells us they put John, the beloved, into boiling pot of oil. Persecution. He took his stand. Paul, the apostle, he went to jail. And he went to prison many, many times. Persecution. All that is not happening to you today. Just a little thing to endure. A little persecution to endure. If they endured what they endured. And we are going to the same heaven. How is it that these little, little, little things we cannot endure? Yes, yea. And all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse. Deceiving and being deceived. If you say... I will wait until things get better. I will wait until everybody is friendly with my stand. I will wait until everybody can see eye to eye with me. I will wait until everybody will encourage me to stand for righteousness. It will never happen. It will never happen. If you are waiting, you wait too long. Because it says evil men and seducers will wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. What do we do then? Verse 14. But continue. You will continue. I said you will continue. That's the secret of the righteous life. Of the rapturable life. Rewardable life. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned. And hast been assured of. Knowing of whom thou hast learned them. First Timothy chapter 4. First Timothy chapter 4 verse 15. Meditate upon these things. Give thyself holy to them, and that thy profiting may appear unto all. Take heed to thyself, and unto the doctrine continue in them. That's the secret. Continue in them. For in doing this, thou shalt both save thyself, and them that hear thee. Perseverance in the path of righteousness is what God demands. And that is what he will reward. Consistency with a steadfast heart in an uncompromising life is a secret of pleasing God. Anyone may take a firm stand for a day, for a brief moment of time. But to live a righteous life and to live by a righteous principle for many years without interruption, that is a real test and the evidence of an abiding grace of God in us. Daniel's life of righteousness was not as a morning cloud or as the early dew of the morning that goes away. His decision was not like Jonah's plant, which came up in a night and perished in a night. Some decisions have no root in the heart. These so-called Christians for a while believe, and in time of temptation, they fall away. Like the Galatians, some did run well. But looking at their present lives, not rooted in Christian principle, we're asking, where then is the blessedness that ye speak of? The beauty of the believer's uncompromising life is its continuity and consistency. Daniel's commitment to a holy lifestyle without compromise continued for more than three years. In fact, more than 70 years Indeed, to the very end of his life. I pray that God will help everyone also continue. Only continued integrity will have the impact of continued influence. The value of our uncompromising life is in daily resisting the devil. Notice that. Daily mortifying the deeds of the flesh. Notice what daily. Daily refusing to yield to the pressures of the world. Daily rejecting the pleasures of Egypt and of Babylon. Daily standing up against the threats and the encroachment of the world. That's the difference between Joseph and Samson. Samson stood and resisted just for a short moment of time. But Joseph, in his own case, resisted consistently, steadfastly, unto the very end, walking with God daily, overcoming the world and the flesh daily, saying no 
to Satan and to his ambassadors consistently. That is what is referred to as the uncompromising Christian life. We come to the reward of that uncompromising life. The honor, the favor, divine favor of that uncompromising life. Point number three, the promised heritage for an uncompromising life. The promised heritage of an uncompromising life. I'm reading from Daniel chapter 1, verses 15 and 16. Daniel chapter 1, verse 15. And at the end of the ten days, their countenances appeared fairer and fatter in flesh than all the children which did eat the portion of the king's meat. Thus Melzer took away the portion of their meat and the wine that they should drink, and he gave them pulse. You'll see what the Lord did for them. The Lord honored them. I pray the Lord will honor you. The Lord favored them. The Lord will favor you. But you see the honor, the favor, the blessing, the blessedness came as a result of Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego taking their stand and saying, here is where we stand. We're going to live for the Lord. Now we're looking at Proverbs chapter 21. Proverbs chapter 21. In Proverbs chapter 21, verse 21, He that followeth after righteousness and mercy findeth life, findeth righteousness, and findeth honor. You follow after a righteous life, and you say, I'm going to live righteously. I'm going to live a life that brings glory and honor to God. Then the Lord says, I will honor you. John chapter 12, verse 26. John chapter 12. Reading from verse 26. If any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. Him will my father honor. You see what the Lord is saying? He says, you follow the Lord, you serve the Lord, live an uncompromising life, and then you'll find the honor of the Lord and the grace of God coming abundantly upon your life. Deuteronomy chapter 26. Deuteronomy chapter 26. I'm reading from verse 16. Honor the Lord, he will honor you, serve the Lord, he'll favor you, and then he'll bless you as well. 26 of Deuteronomy chapter 26 verse 16. This day the Lord thy God has commanded thee to do thee statutes and judgments. Thou shalt therefore keep and do them with all thine heart. What your whole heart, your whole strength, your whole mind, your whole commitment, and with all thy soul. Thou hast avouched the Lord, you have accepted the Lord, and you have confessed that the Lord is your God this day about him to be the Lord thy God and to walk in his way and to keep his statutes and his commandments and his judgments and to hearken to his voice and the Lord has about thee assured thee this day that you are his peculiar people as he has promised thee and that thou shouldest keep all his commandments to make be high above all nations. If you follow the Lord without any compromise, he'll make you high above all others around you in Jesus' name. Which he has made. And in praise, and in name, and in honor. And that thou mayest be an holy people unto the Lord thy God, as he has spoken. Genesis chapter 22. In Genesis chapter 22, we see the faithfulness of Abraham. And the kind of faithfulness the Lord is expecting from you and expecting from me. As a result of that devotion to the Lord, that commitment to the Lord, that's how the Lord eventually honored and blessed Abraham. Genesis chapter 22 verse 16, and said by myself, have I sworn, says the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing, and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, 
that in blessing I will bless thee. You see what the Lord is saying here. Now, what happened to Daniel? He said, I'm not going to defile myself. And the Lord, because of that, honored him with his three friends and blessed him with his three friends. The same thing with all the people you find in the Bible. When they take their stand and they say, I'm going to live a righteous life, a holy life, an uncompromising life. That steadiness in following after the Lord, not only one day, one week, one year, but all through your life, the Lord blesses that steadfastness in following the Lord, that in blessing I will bless thee. And in multiplying, I will multiply thy seed as the stars of heaven, and as the sand which is upon the seashore. And thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. Now think about what God told Abraham to do. Bring your son. Sacrifice that son to me. If Abraham went for counseling, what will the people tell him? They say, no, you can't do that. They didn't hear the voice of God. God did not reveal that to them. It was to Abraham he revealed that. And so even though other people may not understand, that's what God called him to do. And because he did what God called him to do, without compromising with flesh and blood, that's how God blessed him. Today is not requesting that you bring your son as a sacrifice. It may be that he's requesting you bring your substance as a sacrifice to him. Look at verse 16. By myself have I sworn, says the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing and hast not withheld thy substance, thine only substance from the Lord. It may be today all is asking from you is your skill your learning, your ability. And as you bring your skill to the Lord, others may say, what's happening to you? If you take this skill to the marketplace in the world, you might be a millionaire. And God is saying, bring that skill. Don't take it to the world. Bring it to me and lay it upon my altar. And if you will not compromise with flesh and blood, they may not understand. They may be telling you, Brother so and so has the same skill, ability as you have, is making money. Sister so and so has the same skill, the same ability, the same training as you have, is choosing it to generate funds for himself. Don't worry about what they say. People might not understand Abraham, but the Lord said, Here is just what I have for you. If I'm looking at Lord, Lord, are you giving your son to God like I'm doing? No. Because Lord is not doing that does not choose me. You are the one God has spoken to you. And the Lord is saying, look at verse 16 by myself, verse 1. Says the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing and hast not withheld thy skill, your marketable skill from me, that in blessing I will bless thee. It may be it's your love and your affection. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. That it may be well with you and you may prolong your days that you live upon the earth. Other people may just give a part of their love for you. It's all your love, all your affection is asking for. And then you say anything that contradicts that, God forced in my life. The love of God forced in my life. And the Lord is saying by myself of my sworn, says the Lord. Because thou hast done this and has sought to withheld your affection your heart, your love, from me, that in blessing, I will bless thee. Maybe he's asking for your time. Time is money. And time is very precious. Maybe in other churches, that's what they are telling you. Ah, you spend all your life in the music ministry in the church. How much are they paying you? Well, you say, I just give it to the Lord. Ah, that's how you do it over there. In our church, they pay the choir master salary because, you know, it takes time. And they pay all those members of the choir worship team. They pay them money. At the end of the year, they buy vehicles for them. Ah, that's them. Over here, I give everything I have to the Lord without asking for reward. And the Lord is saying, by myself, I my sworn, says the Lord, because thou hast done this. And thou hast not withheld 
thy talent, thy musical talent. You have not withheld that from me, that in blessing I will bless thee. And sometimes they'll call you in other churches and say, uh, we know that you have experience in deeper life as an usher, as a security man. Why don't you come over to our church? Because in our church, they don't only really pay their pastors and pay their overseers and pay their bishops. They pay the ushers and they pay this and they pay that. Why don't you come? If you don't understand the life of Daniel, you'll say, well, I still believe the Bible. No, you don't still believe the Bible. Now you believe in money. But the Lord is saying, all your skill, all your training, you give it unto the Lord. It's not for pay. It's not for commercial reason. And the Lord is saying, by myself have I sworn, says the Lord. For because thou hast done this sin, and hast not withheld thy training ability, what you have got by training, you have not withheld that from me, that in blessing I will bless thee, your tithes. That the Lord is saying, bring all the tithes and the offering into the storehouse, that there may be meat in my house, and prove me herewith, if I will not open the windows of heaven, and pour you down blessings that you'll not have enough room to receive. There are some people that will say, well, paying tithes and offering, eh, but what I have is not even enough. How can I do that? And that's what we are talking about, an uncompromising life. A life that is not looking at what do I gain, what do I get, what do I benefit, what profits me. I'm thinking about what does God want, whether it hurts me, whether I have enough money or not. Here is what God demands. And God is saying, by myself have I sworn, says the Lord, for because thou hast done this, and has not withheld thy tithes and offering from me. I know that's all you have. But you are not withheld it from me. That in blessing, I will bless thee. The Lord will bless you. I said the Lord will bless you. Uh, is there a husband there? And you know, your wife has responsibility in the church. And you too, you want to have responsibility in the church. And then you call your wife, you say, let's strike a bargain. If I am a worker in the church and you are a worker in the church and uh, we're finished late and then both of us are coming back home late, how are we going to, you know, get this done, get this done? Why don't we strike a deal? Let me remain a worker and you stay at home. If I come to Bible study, you come to Bible study and then we get back home late, you know, food and all that. Let me go to the Bible study. I'll come back to tell you what they said. You're withdrawing your wife from the Lord. And the Lord is saying, by myself have I sworn, says the Lord, for because thou hast done this sin, hast not withheld thy wife, thine only helper from me, that in blessing I will bless thee. And that's what Daniel did. He said, I lay my life on the altar. Whatever the consequence, whatever will happen, here is Babylon. I'm a stranger here. I purpose in my heart, I'm going to follow the Lord. And the Lord bless that man. And God is looking for Daniels today, Ruth today, Esther's today, people, Mary's today, that will yield themselves totally to the Lord. And the Lord will pour abundant blessings upon your life in Jesus' name. It's a time of uncompromising life, and it's a time of great blessing. Daniel lived his own time, and he got abundance of the blessing of God. This is your time. You are going to be blessed. But then you'll take an uncompromising stand like Daniel. You are the Daniel of today. And God will give you grace to stand. Can you stand? Why don't you stand? Stand up and tell the Lord, Oh Lord, I'm going to serve you. I'm not going to bench the rule. I'm not going to yield to the enemy. I'm not going to yield to their temptation, to their pressure. Lord, I will stand. You tell the Lord... This takes salvation, my brother, my sister, children. This takes salvation. We must be born again. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And we cannot have the grace to stand if we're not born again. We cannot do this in the energy of the flesh. It has to be in the energy, in the power of the Spirit of God. The grace to stand that comes at salvation salvation, being born again. 
you confess your sins to God and you tell him to forgive you and then you believe that Jesus died for you on the cross of Calvary. It is through that death of Jesus on the cross of Calvary that Christ becomes your savior, your sin bearer, your substitute. And you transfer all your guilt, all your condemnation unto Christ. And then he transfers his righteousness and strength unto you. After you are saved, there is an experience in the Bible that is called sanctification. And Jesus prayed for the sanctification of his disciples. And he prayed for you too. Sanctify them. I pray not for the world, but I pray for them whom you have given me. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. And through the blood of the everlasting covenant... He has perfected forever them that are sanctified. He that sanctifies and they which are sanctified are, follow, are all of one. For which cause is not ashamed to call them brethren. This is the will of God. Even your sanctification. The very God of peace sanctify you holy. And I pray God that your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless until the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Faithfully see that call at you who also will do it. Yes, he sanctifies today. He saves us by the blood of the everlasting covenant. He sanctifies us too. By that same blood, if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with him and with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses, purifies, purges us from all unrighteousness, free from sin, within and without. It's that experience of real, genuine salvation, real, genuine sanctification. That makes you to be able to have an uncompromising stand, cleansed heart, purified heart, circumcised heart, sanctified heart. Makes you to have a purpose of heart that you will not defile yourself with anything defiling the world today. I pray that God will give you wisdom, courtesy for lightness, courage, faith, to go along with that purpose of heart. So you will live a life that brings glory to God, a life that brings honor to his name. Like Abraham, you are not withholding your son, the most precious thing in your life. You're not withholding it away from the Lord, your substance your service, your skill, everything you've got. You're not putting your skill in the market, asking for the highest bidder. Anybody may promise you anything. We'll pay you for this, we'll pay you for that. But you say, no, it belongs to the Lord. My life for the Lord, my skill for the Lord, my talent for the Lord. My tithes and offering for the Lord. Everything I've got, I give to the Lord. Freely has he given me, and freely I give. Let your wives serve the Lord too. Let your children be free to serve the Lord. For the deepest, the highest, the greatest consecration possible. And you lead the way. To serve the Lord without interruption. And to serve the Lord without any self-centered consideration. Have a purpose of heart. And say, Lord, I purpose in my heart. I consecrate. I lay everything on the altar. I want to serve you better than I ever did in my life. A great change. A mighty change. A wonderful change, transformation. 
as the life of Daniel is an encouragement to us today, that your life will be an encouragement to all the people too. To be stronger, more firm, more righteous, more steadfast, more yielded, more committed. Is the purpose of heart, is the decision you take, and you seal that decision. And you say, Lord, this is what I have said. I've opened my mouth unto you. Come what may, this is irreversible. I'll serve you to the very end. Give me all the grace I need, all the faith I need, all the courage I need, all the wisdom I need. All the politeness I need, all the courtesy I need, all the consecration I need to make. Lord, help me. And with purpose of heart, I'll serve you and follow you through until the very end.